I'm here to tell you about motivation and emotion, which um, I, you've, from my point of view is perhaps in many ways the guts of psychology and may well be the thing that the you, uh, uh, as people interested in first-year psychology, may well have thought psychology was about, because motivation is about why people do what they do, which, uh, whether you're a psychologist or not, is something that we spend much of our energy, our social energy, trying to work out why people do what they do. And emotion is about why people feel what they feel. And there is a good reason that often these two topics get put together, because they're not separate topics. And it's often the case that our emotions serve as a guide to tell us what to do or what to avoid uh, from a motivational point of view. So um, the lecture today does reflect the broad topics in Chapter 10 in your, in your textbook. Um, so I'll give you a bit of a taste or a flavour at least um, about motivation and emotion uh, loosely using the, the structure from that textbook. Uh, I teach a third year unit called Motivation and Emotion, so we spend you know, 10 weeks or 12 weeks on what we're doing uh, here in an hour and a half, uh, and I'll tell you more about that at the end. Uh, I'm also the fourth year honours convener, so uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that for those of you who may be interested in going on to fourth year psychology. Um, in terms of the learning objectives or the, or the structure of this content, um, if you look at one and five there, they're about distinguishing between the theoretical perspectives for motivation and then number five, distinguish, distinguish, distinguishing between the theoretical perspectives for emotion. And they won't be unfamiliar to you because we'll talk about evolutionary perspective, psychodynamic perspectives, behaviourist perspectives uh, and cognitive type perspectives. So things that you should have been learning about along the way uh, in terms of the history of development in psychological uh, thinking, we'll use those kind of frameworks to try and um, explain how we could uh, approach understanding motivation and emotion. But it probably makes most sense to try and pick some specific behaviours and to then apply those frameworks to those behaviours. Uh, hence the textbook picks eating, which you might think of as a very simple behaviour, but it turns out to actually be quite a complex motivational behaviour. And um, sexual behaviour, what, what drives and triggers um, our sexual motivations. They're by no means the only motivations. There's a wide kaleidos kaleidoscope of motivated behaviours, but that provides you with two kind of concrete uh, examples where we can look at these perspectives in, in action. Uh, and then number four there refers to psychosocial motives. So eating and sex we can think of as largely phy physiological or biological um, but driven behaviours. We don't, that's what distinguishes us from anim, most animals, I guess, is that we're not just motivated by our um, survival instincts and our procreation instincts, but people come to university and people go and try and save others um, in less fortunate circumstances. Uh, and so people also have other sorts of goals that are not easy to explain purely um, through evolutionary or, or biological perspectives. So we loosely gather them together into what we call psychosocial motives, such as motivation to achieve uh, or uh, to, um, whether that's sort of in a career sense or in a social status sense um, or just for your own curiosity and interest. People have all sorts of hobbies and curiosities that they dedicate large amounts of time to. So you can then divide the content of what we're talking about into motivation and emotion and we'll have a look at definitions and then some perspectives and examples. 
So starting with motivation. Now I guess psychology gives motivation a slightly different definition from what the person in the street might give. Um, the person in the street probably thinks, if you ask them what motivation is, they say, oh well it's you know, pumping yourself up and going in and winning a fight or, um, or doing something really amazing. And that is part of motivation. But we also, in psychology, would say that every single behaviour is, and even non-behaviour, like choosing to hold back and not do anything, is a behaviour. Every single behaviour is motivated. Like there's a reason, a psychological reason behind every single action, whether that's a conscious action or an unconscious action. So motivation is much broader and in fact it's really the, the, the science of trying to discover why people do anything at all. Interestingly, the word motivation is derived from a Latin verb Mover, and that um, root, that MOT, you can see coming through in both mo the word motivation and emotion. And the Latin verb literally meant to move. So in many ways it's, the, it's our explanation for why people don't just lay there in a vegetative state for their entire existence. People get up and do things, but they get up and do different things. So we're interested to try and explain why one person gets up and you know, takes drugs and somebody else gets up and goes and feeds homeless people and somebody else gets up and tries to climb the, the corporate ladder. So if you think about yourself then, what made you even get out of bed this morning? Why didn't you just stay in bed? Maybe some of you are still in bed listening to the recorded lecture. Um, something, something made you get out. Maybe it was excitement about something that was going to happen today, uh, so positive expectation. Maybe it was fear of punishment and negative consequences if you didn't get out of bed um, that made you get out. Maybe it was an alarm clock, some sort of aversive stimulus uh, and so on. So we can say then that motivation is whatever it is that makes you act and behave the way you do, which includes why you start certain behaviours at certain times, where you direct that energy, so the kind of goal-driven nature. Most behaviours have some sort of goal in mind, consciously or unconsciously. Um, it might just be to annoy someone, but it, it's got a, you've got some sort of goal in mind. So why do we start? Why do we focus on the particular goals that we do? Why do we maintain that behaviour over time, even when perhaps there's other forces, competing forces? So how do we um, choose to prioritise and continue certain behaviours? And why do we then stop those behaviours at some point? There's very few behaviours that just go on forever. Um, at some point we choose to stop and, and, and undertake different behaviours. Uh, other words that you might come across, kind of key words that are associated with motivation are words like needs, wants, interests, desires. Collectively these are things that tend to either draw us towards something or push us away from things. So motivation is also about um, fear, uh, anxiety and moving away from the things, disgust, moving away from the things or avoiding the things that we, we don't want to be uh, associated with or don't want to encounter. So um, some definitions talk about motivation as the energy. It's, it's the energy or the fuel that makes us do things uh, but it's also the goal directedness so it's where we focus that energy. And the other kind of orientating thought here is that there's essentially two major sources of that motivational energy. Uh, there's the biological sources 
which are mostly there to uh, help us survive, maintain our equilibrium or homeostasis in all of our physiological systems and functioning, uh, as well as to appropriate and, and care for um, our offspring. And then there's those, if you like, more cerebral or cognitive needs or goals which are around that once you have managed to survive, what else do you choose to do based on your curios curiosities and interests and um, often culturally in, um, influenced goals. Uh, so we get taught by parents, by schools, by media, by our culture, what sorts of things we should value and strive for and choose to put our uh, kind of discretional energy towards. Uh, so with those two broad themes, what we tend to find is that the biological motives are reasonably universal across cultures, across time and between individuals. Uh, if I ask you all to hold your breath now, whilst you can all hold your breath for various amounts of time, sooner or later all of you are going to give up and take a breath. And that's one of the more basic, predictable human needs, is the need for oxygen. But eventually if we sat here for long enough, you guys would go, I'm sick of this lecture, I've got to go and get a drink or I've got to eat. Uh, or if the room became too hot or cold, you would feel the urge to move or undertake a behaviour to adjust temperature. Sooner or later we all need to go to the toilet. Sooner or later we all need to have, have sleep. So we often don't kind of count these things in because they're largely unconscious. If your body's healthy, then it actually does a pretty good job of telling you when to perform these various behaviours. But they are all part of our kind of motivational system and what they have in common is to keep you alive and well and surviving um, so that you then have an opportunity to possibly procreate or to um, pursue your psychosocial goals. The psychosocial goals, though, are things that are much more varied and they're much more difficult to predict on the basis just of our genetics and biology. So these are goals that, um, like perhaps autonomy, which is your desire to have control um, and to be self-determined, affiliation, your desire to associate with other people and be socially connected and accepted, uh, dominance, which is social influence, so some people are more motivated than, than others to, to have um, social power um, and so on. There's really no sort of end of those sorts of categories of psychosocial motives, but they do tend to vary a lot more between individuals and between cultures and over time. Um, and you hear things like perhaps Western culture is more self-orientated, Eastern cultures are more group-orientated or affiliation-orientated. Now you may have come across this phrase in Psych 101, or perhaps you haven't, this idea that we are all naive psychologists. In other words, everybody most of the time is trying to figure out why other people do what they do, so, without even realising, you probably have been thinking a lot about motivation um, and it's not an uncommon conversation for two people to get together and talk about why they think X dumped her or um, X is chasing her and trying to work out what the underlying motives are. In part because if we can accurately predict why people do things, then our own environment becomes much more in control because we can know when and why somebody might do what they're going to do. Um, so it gives us a sense of less unpredictability. A lot of what comes up in the news is often unpredictability. That's, that's news when, when somebody did something unusual or unpredicted and we, we didn't see it coming. Uh, look, I'm going to skip 
there. So, in summary, in relation to this introduction, we can say that everything we do does have some rooting in biology, but that it's shaped over time as well by parenting, schooling, culture, etc. And we'll see this more when we look at emotion, that when and how to express emotions. Is, the emotions are, to a large extent, biologically triggered and driven, but how we express them and what's a socially acceptable way to express and deal with our emotions, that's something that is shaped by, by how we're taught uh, over time. And we'll touch on these essentially two components, that there's a, a cognitive component, which is our thinking. You can have an emotion, but you can override that to a certain extent by telling yourself to calm down, relax, um, don't show emotion, don't cry, um, and there's the feeling part of it as well, which is the subject of um, biochemically triggered um, positive or negative experience around that emotion. And ultimately we want to put these back together because they do work in unison, they're part of a, um, a sort of dynamic system that we've acquired to guide our, our behaviour. So what we'll do now is have a look at um, these sort of major paradigms in psychology and how they would approach the question of uh, how we become motivated to undertake certain behaviours. From an evolutionary perspective, um, probably the earliest theories there was that we are born with what's called instincts. And probably the best example of an instinct is when you see you know, a little duckling come out of its egg. Uh, it pretty much follows the first thing it sees, whether it's a robot or a chicken or a human being, because it just makes, it has the instinct and makes the assumption that the nearest large moving object is, will be its protector. Usually that's mum, but if mum's not around, then it will um, basically follow around in a very predictable way uh, the nearest large, large creature. So from this point of view, it's, uh, animals, including humans, are almost robots, if you like. They're pre-programmed with certain kind of predictable, fixed behaviour patterns that are adapted for survival. And humans are not free of that. There's, you know, a newborn baby has a uh, you know, reflex to suckle so that it, um, it's, it becomes effectively pre-programmed to be able to feed itself. It, it's pre-programmed to cry when certain things happen to it and, and so on. Uh, so instincts are an important part of uh, animal behaviour and, and human behaviour. However, for human behaviour, we ha also have more complex systems that are more adaptable. So if you just come pre-built just with a set of instincts and the environment changes, then you're not able to adapt successfully to the environment. Uh, so these instincts are most useful when we're just talking really about survival behaviours and reproductive behaviours. They become much less useful when we start talking about complex uh, cultural behaviours. The psychodynamic perspective, um, a lot of people think that it's kind of airy-fairy, the, the Freudian stuff, and to some extent that's true, but what a lot of people miss is that it actually derives from evolutionary theory. Uh, so Freud was a medical doctor first, before he became more interested in the mind. But even then, there was a strong basis in biology and, and evolution for um, uh, everything that he talked about. So from a, the Freudian point of view, he argued that what motivates us and drives us to behave is an internal state of tension, which is a kind of psychic tension, but it derives from 
what's called drives, which are unsatisfied biological needs. And Freud suggested that those two basic biological needs are um, sex, but it's more, um, he, he actually referred to it as eros, which is the creative kind of life instinct. And it's the approach instinct. It's the energy that draws you towards things and makes you want to create things and engage in things. And um, sexual behaviour is a part of that, but it's not just sex, it's also love um, and intimacy as well as the kind of sexual, sexual lust. And then the other major energy or drive is actually more around um, what Freud called thanatos, which is the darker instinct. So that's the aggression or destructive instinct. And that's the desire to be self-protective and controlling of your environment. And if there's a threat, to go out there and eliminate that threat um, by, by using your energy or your power to, to destroy it. So if either of those kind of basic instincts get sort of builds up and inside without being acted upon, then Freud basically argued that you would eventually either act directly in line with those instincts or you would suffer a consequence, if you like, by repressing or trying to push away or ignore that underlying tension. Uh, it's a bit like physics that you can't create or destroy matter. The idea was that once that tension exists, you, it will come out one way or another. Um, since Freud, then a lot of other people have worked with the psychodynamic perspectives and the more sort of contemporary view has kind of rebadged in some ways those um, love and death kind of instincts and they would talk perhaps more now about the need for relatedness, which is that affiliative need, um, and the need for self-esteem, which is the sort of self-protection, um, self-maintenance need. The other important thing then that comes out of the psych psychodynamic perspective is the idea that we may not be aware of what our motivations are. We might be, but we might not be, and it's possible that people behave and um, uh, don't fu aren't fully aware of why it is. So we distinguish between unconscious or implicit motivation and conscious explicit motivation. And we know that sometimes we we're often quite harsh on people's hypocrisies, but when somebody says that they're going to do something, but they actually do something else, and we've all done it, I'm going to go and work on my essay or on my, my assignment, but in reality I'm going to sit down and watch TV, um, then we, that's, that's that conflict between the conscious motivation that you want to be goal orientated, but the unconscious motivation that the short-term pleasure or interest um, wins out. And you can think of motivation, if you like, as a series of parallel and competing motivations. And you might be sitting here right now and you might be aware that there's not just one motivation going on for you. Some of you are hungry and want to go and get some dinner. Some of you have got kids at home and you're wondering about how they're going after school. Others are, you know, you're interested in the topic and you want to get an HD so you're taking as much information in but somehow you've got to decide which of those motivations in any moment are going to win out um, and each of them kind of has their own intensity curves and as the intensity for one motivation drops off, the intensity for another one might pick up and then you'll switch tasks to the one that you decide to prioritise. Now because we saying that some motivations might be unconscious, then it does leave us with a bit of a puzzle as to how do we access those mo unconscious motivations. And the psychodynamic perspective is then that we need to come up with indirect ways to access it because if we 
simply give somebody a questionnaire or um, interview them, we won't necessarily get access to the underlying implicit motives. Uh, you may have come across this already, but uh, this is one way to assess motivations implicitly. Uh, and in, this, in the thematic apperception test, people get shown a series of 10 ambiguous pictures that often show one or two people in some um, scenario. And the person is asked to tell a story about what has, ha what has led up to this particular moment in time, what's happening right now, how each of the characters is thinking and feeling, and what the resolution or what, what the outcome is from, from the situation. And there's a fairly elaborate kind of scoring mechanism that goes with the test. The idea is that somebody, for example, who is very achievement orientated, trying to get high grades, trying to earn money, trying to uh, improve their career, is more likely to tell a story about, um, say, this couple here, that he's just lost his job and they're going to have to move out of their house and, you know, she's um, really upset that uh, they're going to have to move away from their, um, the, the opportunities they, that they have and so on. Whereas somebody who's more focused on affiliation and relationships might say that she's just found out that he's had an affair and she's really upset um, and uh, somebody else who cares more, say, about um, cultural and family status, maybe he's done something really awful and, and embarrassing that's brought shame to their family. So when people tell a series of stories, you start to be able to pull out the themes that, and that w it's a bit like, you know, people's dreams supposedly reveal some of their underlying motives. This is a systematic attempt um, to try and elicit what people's underlying motivations might be. Okay, so the behaviourist perspective. Um, draws on the, um, on the evolutionary and biological perspective. Um, so it suggests that um, drives are those states of arousal that come from unfulfilled needs and the needs being those kind of biological survival requirements. Um, and that what happens is that we become uncomfortable when we have, when we're not at our optimal equilibrium. So if you don't have quite enough food in your stomach or you've got a bit too much food, then you're uncomfortable and that motivates you to either go and seek food or to stop, stop eating. So when you're in the act of re reducing that drive by either consuming or um, going out and exercising because you maybe have overeaten, that is a positive or pleasurable thing. And we all know what it's like, say, to eat when you're hungry or drink when you're thirsty. Um, that feels good and that becomes a behavioural reinforcer. So if you undertake certain behaviours that give you satis satisfaction of reducing that, that drive, then that can then become a learnt behaviour and a rewarded behaviour that people tend, tend to repeat. Um, and there, can, there are drives that are primary, they're the ones that are kind of pre-wired into us, but we can also learn drives, learn things. So, um, you know, a, a recently learnt need, if you like, is the need to be constantly connected to your phone or to your... Um, to your computer or, or to social media. That's not something that we were inbuilt with, but we have successfully enculturated a kind of um, phobia if we get disconnected and people feel increasing amounts of anxiety. So that would be a, a secondary need. Uh, it's not needed for survival, but people often perceive that it's necessary for their, uh, their personal well-being. Well 
So the cognitive perspective builds upon a behaviourist perspective by arguing that there are motivations that don't really map back to our biological needs. So we can actually just, if you like, create needs through our own desire. We might see something that we really admire on TV or a, a sports person that, that we um, inspires us and then we start to make that our goal and this doesn't seem to have any biological basis at all. So it would seem then that we come to have um, things that we value, that we choose to like and um, that might be personal but it might be family driven or, or culture driven and that we also perceive that there's a degree of likelihood of, a, of us actually achieving those things that we value and that what we do if you like is a kind of mental arithmetic whereby we weigh up how valuable certain goals would be to us with how likely it is that we could actually achieve those goals and that that's, if you like, how we decide what to pursue. So if you come across some, you know, um, beautiful woman or man that you see on TV who's some mega movie star over in the, U in the US and you fall in love with this person and you think, wouldn't it be wonderful if they married you? That might be an example of something that you would really value and some people do become incredibly obsessed, for example, with um, certain celebrity figures. But we might say, look, the likelihood of that actually happening is pretty low um, and therefore we might not pursue it when there's an attractive person that's much, more, much near, nearer by. Maybe we don't value that person as highly but it's far more likely that we could build a relationship with them and therefore we might choose to you know, compromise on, our, um, on some ideal. So people are quite pragmatic as well and you, as I said, you've got those multiple goals going on at any moment and you're probably doing some sort of cognitive weighing up of which of the options is actually, would give you a cost benefit um, return for the energy that you might put into pursuing it. Uh, from the cognitive perspective then, the goals that we end up adopting are things that are established through social learning and by social learning we mean things like observing others and being inspired by them uh, or through the reinforcement and punishment of parents, teachers, um, leaders, media, etc. saying don't do that and do do this. Um, don't go overseas and fight for ISIS. Here's the arguments why you should, should, do some, should stay here and d do something else. So we often actually have competing messages from our social environment about what's good, what's bad, and um, we have to navigate our way through, uh, through that information. Uh, and finally there, from the co cognitive perspective, there's much more consciousness of goals and it's our conscious goals that are more dominant in guiding and explaining human behaviour. Or at least, I guess, the, they form perhaps some of the more interesting behaviours because the um, evolutionary and biological perspectives are more focused on the survival type behaviours. So, um, as you go on with the cognitive perspective of motivation um, and when you start getting into topics like leadership and teamwork uh, and how to motivate people to achieve their kind of highest potential, how do you motivate an unmotivated employee at work, for example, a lot of it comes back to this notion of intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic motivation. An extrinsic motivation is when people are dangling a carrot out in front of you or wielding a big stick and in that case the motivation to behave is something that's coming from the outside. It's either a reward or a punishment um, making you 
behave in a certain way, whereas intrinsic motivation is something that you do because you want to do it and it's not guided from the outside. In fact, it may even be that you have to fight against um, the outside to achieve that, that inner, inner passion. So things like what you do with your discretional time and energy, uh, your hobbies, your curiosities, your in interests, the things you do once you've satisfied your survival needs, that represents uh, your intrinsic motivations. And so when we talked about what people in the street might think of as motivation, what they're probably thinking of is this intrinsic motivation which is often why, how and why people do very amazing things if they channel most of that energy into climbing Mount Everest or becoming an Olympic athlete or giving their life over to religious service or, or something like that. Uh, they often inspire us as examples of people who have channeled, I guess, their intrinsic motivation in a particular direction and towards a particular goal. Um, in the third year unit we spend quite a bit of time talking about something called self-determination theory. Uh, the key thing about that is, is that it suggests that there are three psychological ingredients for intrinsic motivation. So in answer to that question about how do you motivate an unmotivated person in, in the workplace, um, self-determination theory would suggest there's three areas that if you can work on those, they will lead towards intrinsic motivation. So the first of those is competence and that's really about people's skills. So if people feel like they have the skills to perform an action, then they're much more likely to want to do that, that action. Uh, if you know how to ride a mountain bike, um, then you're much more likely to want to go and ride a mountain bike over rocky ground. Uh, the second element is autonomy, which is about people feeling like they have control and choice. So uh, that is really the opposite of that extrinsic approach where people are being made to do it. If people feel like they have choice over, say, at work, yes, there's work that needs to be done, but perhaps people can choose what order they do it in. Perhaps they can have flexibility in their working hours so they can work when they want to work on it as long as they get, get the task done. Um, so the more ways you can foster that sense of people feeling like, yeah, well, I'm choosing to do this rather than I'm being made to do it. And thirdly, uh, relatedness refers to a positive social environment where people are recognised for the tasks that they perform um, and they achieve some sort of social status and, and well-being through... So they're, they're socially valued. Um, so they're the three kind of key ingredients to fostering intrinsic motivation, which there is strong evidence for, is the preferred type of motivation. So somebody intrinsically motivated uh, in the vast majority of situations will outperform somebody who's extrinsically motivated. Uh, therefore, it seems to be desirable to try and foster the development of um, intrinsic motivation. Now possibly the most famous uh, motivational model you may well have come across before uh, is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maybe, it, it's certainly probably in the top five best known psychological models or theories. Uh, probably Freud's id ego, super ego is, is, is the best known psychological theory. Uh, Maslow was an animal psychologist and a, a physiologist first, but then over time he became more and more interested in uh, people fulfilling their potential and he studied, uh, did a study basically of a hundred people who he saw as very successful in their life 
That didn't necessarily mean external success, but it did mean that they fulfilled their potential in a particular area or, or domain. And what Maslow argued was that once we've met our physiological needs, which he saw as primary, then we would start to pursue more psychological needs. But that if we neglected the physiological needs, that we would be drawn back in a particular situation because they were stronger to working on uh, fulfilling those physiological needs. So you may have seen um, something like this triangle or pyramid which is constructed to try and illustrate that before you can move up to the higher needs um, up the top here, you need to have satisfied these lower level needs like breathing, food, water, sleep, etc. Uh, that once they were satisfied, people would be looking at things like housing, uh, warmth, security, etc. You might think of, say, people in Nepal at the moment and realise that they're probably back down at their first level or if they've you know, got some food then they're starting to work, uh, work on securing their safety. That if, when that's satisfied we start caring a bit more about relationships, uh, friends, family, uh, sexual intimacy, etc. And that once you've got that kind of social um, safety or social security, that we then start thinking more about ourselves, uh, self-esteem, doing the things that we want to do, uh, gaining respect of others, etc. And then that the final kind of stage there that Maslow suggests is this notion of self-actualisation, which is really about people being able to pursue the things that really matter to them and they really care about. Um, working on fascinating problems uh, or values that are, are really deep and important. And Maslow argued that that self-actualisation is a motivation for everyone and that I guess part of the motivational puzzle is to kind of pick your way through those lower needs sufficiently over your lifetime that you can then dedicate yourself to some other um, you know, arguably greater causes. Now I might add that there's mixed evidence about um, Maslow's hierarchy and that's something that we go a bit more into in, in third year psychology. Okay, so we've had a look at those five perspectives. What we'll do now is have a closer look at two particular sorts of behaviours, um, eating and then uh, sexual behaviours and then we'll take a look at uh, theories of emotion. Now eating is a deceptively complex behaviour. Um, a lot of us uh, don't think too much about why we eat when we eat, uh, what we eat. Some of us do think about it a lot and perhaps, uh, perhaps overthink it. So we can describe eating as a behaviour and that sounds obvious but remember psychology tries to bring by and large everything back to a behaviour because it's observable, it's measurable and um, therefore it's kind of studyable from a scientific point of view. Um, when we ingest food, effectively there's two major phases. There's the absorption phase where we're extracting energy and nutrients from the food and then breaking that into usable um, forms of proteins and, but particularly glycogen which is your sugar or your energy um, or we go or we store that excess energy as fat to be um, metabolised later on. And then during the fasting phase, when you're not eating, then you're drawing on those energy stores, either the glucose in the bloodstream or you're burning the fat into um, usable energy. So 
a motivational system to regulate food intake needs to achieve at least these um, basic tasks. It needs to have some sort of monitoring and detection system to become aware that it's time to start eating. So somewhere it's monitoring something that tells you, hey, I'm getting hungry, um, can you start planning and thinking about where the, the next food intake is going to come from? Uh, it must then trigger the behaviour, so it must initiate and organise eating behaviours to take place. It then needs to monitor the intake, so it needs to choose what to eat, uh, how much of it to eat, and it needs to choose what not to eat. So it's a selective kind of intake. And then at some point it needs to stop you from consuming any more. So it's got to uh, detect when there's been enough food taken in, because it could be dangerous and uncomfortable at least to, to eat too much. Now all of this happens all the time for most of us um, completely unconsciously and largely successfully. So there's been a long history of sort of science into trying working out how each of those tasks are achieved and there's still, um, still not necessarily conclusive um, knowledge about exactly how they work. But some of the key key ideas and key theories are that um, we have what are called some biological set points within our physiolo physiology that we try and maintain and that's that equilibrium that if you go take the fuel tank down too low you want to refuel, if you overfill the fuel tank then, um, then you stop, stop filling up. But what are the kind of feedback mechanisms that are being used? Um, a lot of people think, and there has been research on this, that it's your stomach, that when your stomach is empty that you want to eat and that when your stomach is full you stop eating. And yet there's actually limited evidence and there's been studies that have been done that show that that's not the key, the key mechanism. Uh, one of the mechanisms is actually the amount of blood glucose. So we're monitoring how much sugar effectively or glucose is in the blood. If that starts to drop off, then it triggers um, awareness that we might be hungry. And if that blood glucose is high enough, then we're not triggered to eat or we're um, uh, told, told not to eat. Um, there's good evidence as well, though, that there are some brain mechanisms involved in detecting and uh, when we're hungry and uh, when we've had enough. And in particular, part of the limbic system uh, called the hypothalamus, and it's only quite small, it's about the size of an almond, and it sits below the thalamus, which is that bigger structure there, so hypo is under, and it sits under there really in the, the midbrain. And this is a really rich area that is monitoring uh, in part the, the blood glucose in the bloodstream and receiving messages. And in particular, and, and this is based on animal studies where they get into mice and so on and um, cause lesions in their hypothalamus and to see what happens. So the outside part of the hypothalamus is involved in switching on eating behaviours and the middle part, the central part, is involved in switching off our eating behaviours. And so you may have seen um, pictures like this of, uh, in this case, a rat with a damaged central part of its um, hypothalamus and in other words it doesn't have an off switch now so it just keeps eating, eating, eating um, because we've, his uh, off switch has been disabled. So there is pretty conclusive evidence that the hypothalamus is part of that um, monitoring chain and is critical to uh, healthy intake of, of food. Now there's a lot of other 
factors involved and um, uh, some of these things come up in dieting programs and things like this as tips and suggestions for those, say, who want to eat uh, less food or those who want to eat more food. Uh, food palatability, which is really the, the tastiness of the food. Um, the more plain the food is, the less you want to eat, the more sort of rich tasting, whether it's salty or uh, sweet, etc., uh, the more we're motivated to eat. So if you have relatively plain foods in the fridge and the cupboard, uh, overall you, you're likely to take in less, less kilojoules. Um, food variety is another factor. So when we go to a restaurant or something, often what we get is a variety of food. And so you get something savoury and then you get something sweet. And if you, if you had have just kept giving people savoury foods, they kind of max out on that savoury taste and they say no more. But then you throw in a different flavour, a sour or a sweet, and they say, yeah, I'll, I can eat more. So, uh, and that's probably biological, that if we eat different tastes, then we get in more of the different kinds of nutrients that might be healthy. Uh, time of day, anybody with pets knows that you know, if you feed your pets at a certain time of day, then they just become instantly hungry at um, around about that time through behavioural learning. Um, and similarly, we're, we tend to eat the similar sorts of things at similar times each day. And if you can become a, more aware of that, then that's an opportunity to potentially control um, binge type eating at certain, certain times. Uh, there is pretty good evidence that a lot of our uh, unhealthy calories, for example, are consumed at night time because once our brains get tired by the end of the day we start wanting chocolate and sugar and so on to try and maintain our um, alertness. Uh, uh, there's a social influence. So the more people you eat with, the more you tend to eat. Uh, if you go out with a big group, then... Uh, there seems to be a social facilitation when everybody else is eating for people to eat more. It might be partly that we're not really conscious of eating. When people eat on their own, they tend to be more aware of each bite and each chew um, and each bit of food on their plate. Uh, and memory plays a role. So one of the issues, say, with um, people with dementia is that they can't remember when the last time they ate was and therefore they tend to eat more often. So part of the reason you might not be hungry now is you remember that you ate an hour ago and that's telling you that you, there's no need for you to get hungry at the moment. So that, they're not by any means the only things, but they're some of the sort of food intake uh, triggers that, that there is evidence for. Now, like all kind of systems, the eating system is not perfect and um, significant portions of the population have difficulty with either overeating or undereating. Um, so obesity is now defined as greater than or equal to or being 15% higher than your ideal body weight for your height and age. And this, as we know, is only increasing in industrialised cultures and even that 25%, because I just heard it on the radio on the way in here, they're now saying 33% of the Australian population, over a third, um, are more than 15% above their ideal body weight. And that has significant physiological and psychological health risks associated with it. And then at the other end of the spectrum, there's um, anorexia nervosa is defined as 85% or basically minus 15% of your expected body weight um, and yet still feeling like you're fat or thinking that you're, you're fat and therefore undertaking um, eating restriction. And that affects about 5% of the Australian population with another 5% affected by bulimia, which is 
binging followed by um, some sort of fasting, whether through exercise, vomiting or, or laxative type usage. Now if you add those percentages together then we're saying a third of the population is overeating and then 10% are, are chronically undereating and you've got you know, 43% or something like that which suggests that almost half of the population are struggling it with the regulation of um, healthy eating. So hence there is, you know, this, this is one of the areas that psychologists are, are working with because it's not just a sort of physiological challenge. Some people approach it medically and that may or may not work for them but there's pretty much always some sort of psychological component um, and it may be that things can be dealt with um, psychologically without the need for uh, aggressive kind of physiological um, treatments. Okay, let's um, have a look then at sexual motivation. Now, as we know, sex is everywhere in the animal world and animals don't get all funny about it like, um, like we do um, because if it wasn't for sex there would, be no, um, there would be no life so it's the very essence of, um, of, uh, of life. In insects, sex is not a particularly cerebral activity. It's, it's very physiological, very instinctual. Um, it's mainly influenced by hormones um, like androgens, e estrogen and pheromones, so hormones basically that we, that we smell, give off and, and smell. Sex tends to be a lot briefer and um, you're much more sort of regulated, it's much more predictable. Dogs go on heat at certain times and they're horny then but not at other times um, and so on. And it seems to be predominantly focused around um, successful um, procreation. Uh, now all of those things are true of human beings but because we've kind of evolved um, a cortex which allows us to visualise allows us to predict the future, it allows us to imagine the future and it also allows us to draw on kind of past memories, um, then it would seem that we do spend a lot of our time thinking about sex. And we, it's helpful with human beings then to distinguish um, the sort of physiological procreation from the state of sexual arousal which is the kind of pre-state, if you like, um, before generally uh, sex would occur. So we can say then that sexual arousal is that state of excitement and tension and that's that word coming back from Freud. It, there's uh, an arousal but it's not yet fulfilled, brought about by physiological but also cognitive reactions to some kind of erotic uh, stimuli. So that stimuli can be external and, um, and whether it's visual or, um, or touch or smell or hearing. So any of those five senses can, can give us some kind of uh, sexual, sexually arousing information. But interestingly, we can also be kind of aroused from within through, um, through imagined stimuli, we can visualise hypothetical scenarios, we can have memories, etc. There's evidence of this, for example, from people with spinal cord injury with full quadriplegia who still report sexual arousal, which would suggest that it's not just a physiological experience, it's also a psychological experience. Um, most people, I'd assume, have had you know, dreams, they might be even shocked you of um, being sexually aroused in your dreams and that's not necessarily associated with, with physiological arousal at the time. Uh, the classic study of um, male and female sexual 
arousal and sexual response uh, was by Masters and Johnson, uh, American researchers in the mid-60s to, to 70s. And it's no coincidence that the studies occurred at that time in, in that sort of um, socially kind of liberating period in the US. Eventually, scientists got to the point where they said, well, why can't we study um, scientifically in a lab the sexual behaviours of human uh, males and females? And they literally did pay college students who were couples to come in, spend the night in the lab and have sex and they had various kinds of ways to monitor um, what happened so that they could, um, they could get data. The key thing that came out of that is probably best depicted on the um, diagrams um, that they produced for males and females. And what they said was that, by and large, the sexual response cycle was similar for males and females in that um, both males and females can go through the four phases that they identified, which were um, you know, initial and increasing level of excitement, reaching some sort of plateau of uh, excitement, possibly, but not not always, um, peaking at orgasm and then a relatively rapid um, return to baseline or non-arousal uh, after that. Uh, but the other key point they made was that the female sexual response cycle seemed to be somewhat more variable, so the males was a bit more predictable and didn't deviate as much. Um, after a period of time, males can become re-aroused and, and have a, another orgasm. But for females, it could be a relatively quick peak, but it could be a longer kind of plateau. It could be um, multiple orgasms. Um, so that was what was discovered through, through the Masters and Johnson study, and that still largely holds up um, today. Um, hormones are also influential and hormones are a biological kind of message system that the body uses to activate certain kinds of behaviours at certain times. So hormones are carried in the bloodstream, they're generally manufactured um, in the brain, in the pituitary gland, and released at different times. Um, so you think, say, about growth hormone getting uh, released you know, during childhood, and people grow, but then at some point it gets um, toned down and switched off, so we don't keep growing. But if you go to the Guinness Book of World Records, you can find people who had issues and that the growth hormone never got, never got switched off. Uh, similarly then for sexual behaviour, it is regulated by um, a variety of hormones and that fluctuate, you know, for both for males and females, although we often think about it more, more for females. Um, and indeed prenatal exposure, so even an embryo or um, uh, during development, being exposed to different levels of hormones can change uh, the way that um, that child is uh, structured. Uh, there's also a place for kind of socialisation or social learning, and anthropological studies show that the way in which we choose to express our sexual nor or sexual behaviours is usually in the context of sexual norms that the society says are acceptable or, or non acceptable. And they do actually vary surprisingly widely. Uh, in Western culture, there's the idea that males are more sexually hungry or needy than females, but it's possible to find other cultures where the opposite is, is true and the cultures tell a different story about sexual desire and um, behaviour tends to follow that um, those kind of social norms. 
Uh, another big topic that comes up in terms of motivation and sex is how do we account for sexual orientation. Um, seems to have been a, and still is, culturally a bigger issue, say, in North America, where, where some of this research has been done. Uh, but increasingly the view is that we should view um, sexual orientation on a continuum, so rather than just thinking of people as either heterosexual or homosexual, which is a binary um, categorisation, it would seem that, whether we want to hear it or not, that sexuality is actually much more fine-grained and we can probably put ourselves and other people on a continuum ra ranging from strongly homosexual through to strongly heterosexual. And it's even far more nuanced than that because um, um, people can have mo complex, feel complex feelings or multiple feelings, bisexuality. I think you guys will probably know better than I do, but I think Facebook has now flipped over and there's a huge number of categories for, for sexual orientation. Uh, these honour students doing surveys, it's now expected that you no longer put male or f and female as the only two options when you ask about somebody's gender. It's meant to at least be an other category. Uh, and some of our, even some countries are changing their dictionaries over now so that there's not just him and her, there's also a you know, neutral option or, or another option for people who don't, don't identify strongly with one or the other. Um, having said all of that, there is actually pretty, the, the evidence is probably more on the side of there being biological predictors of hetero and homosexuality more so than um, cultural predictors. And so that evidence is pretty clearly summarised here. Uh, if we want to know how much of an influence genetics has, then the strongest studies are those that um, look at uh, identical twins who are separated at birth and then brought up in different families and they look then at the degree of match between, in this case, um, sexual orientation. So uh, for identical twins who are 100% genetically related, we see here that around about 50%, whether they're male or female, tend, so if you've got an identical twin sibling who's, who's gay, there's a 50% chance that you would also um, identify as being, being gay. So it's not a perfect relationship. There's still a lot of unexplained variance there, 50%. But clearly you're also much more likely um, to, to be gay if, if you've got a um, gay sibling. And you can see it drops as you would predict. Here it's about 25% for a fraternal twin with whom you share 50% of your genetics. And if it's just a brother or sister, who's adopted, in other words, no genetic relationship, um, there's about 5 to 10% chance of having uh, the same sexual orientation. Uh, now there's further studies then into why is that the case, and it might be prenatal environment um, and the hormone exposure in that prenatal environment, uh, as well as the genetic uh, markers. Uh, in terms of what goes wrong with um, sex, well, I, I know a lot of things can go wrong, but in terms of the things that come to the attention of psychologists or that people seek help for, uh, the most common things are all related, interestingly, or when you work psychologically with people, basically to anxiety. And um, that if we become too anxious about anything, we find it difficult to perform whether that's playing music or giving a public speech um, or you know, uh, performing on the sport field, in many ways sexual activity is no, no different. It just tends to happen in more private settings. Um, so for men then, becoming overly anxious can make it difficult to uh, have an erection. And then at the other end of the spectrum, um, it can 
happen all too quickly to be satisfactory for, for men or women uh, with premature ejaculation. Um, and more so in women, but it can also be for men. Um, it can be the, con the concern can be not uh, experiencing orgasm. Uh, but what is most co what's common amongst those issues is that the most or well, the main treatment is uh, a behaviour therapy, where really you're just helping to give people some steps that they can follow, so that they feel confident, um, less anxious, more able to negotiate with a partner, um, so that they can have things go in a way that's going to help them and basically just to learn to modify their emotional responses at various points and facilitate them to achieve um, satis you know, su successful and satisfactory um, sexual behaviour. So it's a gradual kind of reprogramming process uh, to learn a set of behaviours that are going to be uh, satisfactory. Now that's not to say that there can't be physiological reasons for these things and you would want to rule those things out first but if a doctor has found that there's no particular physiological reason that sex isn't happening in the way people want it to happen then you can turn your attention to uh, psychological uh, treatment. Alright, so we've said that sexual motivation certainly has a biological basis, um, you need the physiological development, uh, sex hormones to switch things on and off, uh, as well as some sort of stimuli, whether it's imagined or, or external. Uh, exactly what makes us sexually aroused? That there seems to be biological evidence that, um, or a genetic evidence that uh, homosexuality and heterosexuality is a continuum and it's influenced by um, certain things that may not, people may not have control over. Uh, there's the psychological stimuli, fantasies, etc., which is clearly a, a big part of our um, sexual life. And there's the social, socio-cultural boundaries and frameworks that we put around the, the expression of that. And in many ways you can look at human history through that lens and see it, the story of human history often as about how do we regulate socially acceptable uh, sexual behaviours. Okay, so we've looked at two largely physiological, certainly eating is quite physiological, but we, we have degrees of psychological control and influence. Sexual behaviours, there's probably a bit more psychological influence because you can say that sex is not a survival behaviour. You can survive physiologically without sex. Um, but now we turn to psychosocial motives, which are really all the things we do that we can't explain as an act of survival or, or procreation. Uh, and as we said earlier, you can cluster those things probably into agency or autonomy, things that you do basically for yourself, and relatedness, which is the things you do to fit in with the social environment or to facilitate resources out of the social environment. So you cooperate with your parents, probably if they're paying your uni fees or putting a roof over your head. Um, so most of us don't live on our own. And when I say you don't live in social isolation, and in fact social isolation is generally associated with a not healthy functioning. So we, we have to work out how to live with others. Perhaps the most talked about psychosocial motive is achievement motivation. And this is that the motivation that the person in the street is probably thinking of when you, if you say to them, I've just read a chapter about um, the psychology of motivation. This is what is it that makes people get out there and pursue goals and make sacrifices to achieve those, those goals. 
Um, there are some people who are more highly driven by this than others. So you can, th th we talk about individual differences. Some people are happy to go and lay on the beach um, and have fun and not buy a house or get a job. Others are driven continually almost every waking second of the day to be working actively towards accumulating experience or wealth or resources um, towards something that they, that they value. The common characteristics of high achievers uh, include the following. Uh, high achievers tend to choose what we would say are moderately difficult tasks. Now this relates to kind of challenging themselves. Uh, if you aim for an HD in the unit, then even if you don't get there, you will probably drag your performance up from where it would have been had you just aimed, say, to pass the unit. So moderately difficult goals make people kind of keep working towards something. If you set a goal that's too easy, you become satisfied and then you tend to just sit around. Uh, if you choose something that's overly difficult, though, it seems like it's too far away and it can actually be demotivating um, because you feel like your efforts won't, won't get you anywhere near what you're trying to do. So it's a common kind of workplace thing now that if you're setting annual performance goals, your manager would probably try and encourage you to set something a little bit challenging, even if you might not get there. Um, they'll try and bump it up a little bit to try and foster that drive because we're often trying to close that gap between where we are now and where we want to be and that creates a kind of tension, like that tension that Freud talked about and we're, so we want to try and close that, that gap. So high achievers tend to actually report that they like that state of tension between where they are and where they want to be and they, uh, they thrive on wanting to close that, that gap. Uh, high achievers are able to tolerate failure or um, hitting barriers and they're able to persist at their goal for longer over time than others. So if you've got a fitness goal, it's starting to get cold and dark in the morning, it's harder to get up for a run, uh, the high achievers are able to persist and tolerate the uncomfortableness a bit longer than, than others. They're also able to delay gratification. So they're able to put off the pleasure that they want for longer. Uh, there's a classic study that, called the lollipop study done with preschool students where um, preschool students were given a necklace with a lollipop hanging on the end and they were told that if they don't lick the lollipop for the whole day, that at the end of the day they'll be given two lollipops. And of course that's very difficult for a preschooler when you've got something uh, sweet dangling there. They could eat it now if they wanted to, but they wouldn't get another lo lollipop at the end of the day. The interesting thing about the study though is that they followed those kids longitudinally right into their adulthood and it was the kids who didn't eat their lollipop and got the second one at the end of the day who were more likely to be the high achievers in, in adulthood. Um, so even at that young age, they were able to say, look, I know it's going to be worth my while not to get the pleasure now, to hold out, and then I'll get double, double the reward later on. Um, so we see the high achievers um, you know, achieving more competitive careers, etc. And in many cases, our culture values high achievers and puts them up on pedestals and uh, encourages men of, many of us to, to go down that, that path. Uh, the other thing that high achievers do is that they, are somewhat ironically, um, tend to be, follow more of what we would call mastery goals than performance goals. Performance goals are trying to, say, get an HD because you want an HD. So you're trying to get the, the trophy, if you like, so that you can have it on your transcript, you can show it off to people. Um, what you're motivated for is to get something that gives you probably social status. 
whereas the mastery goal is that you really just want to understand psychology and you're fascinated by yourself, by others and by what we've learned about how human beings um, think and feel and behave. And it, that mastery goal generally leads to deeper learning, more persistent learning and then actually higher achievement. Whereas the performance goal tends to mean that people take shortcuts because they're just they're not necessarily interested in the deep learning. They're trying to tick the boxes or jump through the hoops um, to get the, the carrot at the end of the, the performance. So it relates back to that intrinsic motivation that if we can foster in people an inner motivation, we tend to get deeper learning and um, better performance outcomes. Uh, now, other people you know aren't all that bothered about whether they get a bigger house or get a pay rise or climb the corporate ladder. Um, for them, it's more about having good friends, good family, and um, knowing that they've got that nurturing, positive environment around them. Um, some of us care about how many likes we've got on Facebook, and some people don't don't care at all. Uh, and that might be an indicator of how much people desire the, um, the connection or relatedness or affiliation. Uh, now, there's probably at least two types of that need for relatedness. There's the desire to be kind of intimate with a small number of other people, perhaps only one other person and you would have noticed some people kind of pair off, pair up and then go off into their own little dyadic bubble and um, don't have much connection with others. Um, and affiliation is more about that broader kind of social network and environment. Uh, having lots of friends and acquaintances and being um, you know, well accepted into the, the broader culture. Okay, so that's a little look at psychosocial motives. Um, and now we will turn our attention to emotion and its role in kind of connecting with, with motivation. Now, emotions can be uh, a little bit trickier than motivation in some ways. Um, and a little bit more difficult to define because they're caused by lots of different things. Uh, what we can say is that emotions are your way of evaluating your environment. Now if you think about it, if you've got to have some way of deciding whether things are good or bad because otherwise you could get yourself into a lot of trouble. So we rely on emotion really as, if you like, your sort of inner GPS that's telling you whether to approach things, go towards them because there's good things could happen and come from it, or to avoid things and walk around the situation or avoid that person um, or not go to that party, etc. So at sort of in the first instance then, emotions are those things that give us that kind of positive or negative feeling. It's a bit hard to pin down exactly where they are. Um, emotions have a cognitive component, which is you thinking, oh, I feel a bit nervous, or, um, hey, I really like that person. And that's where you become aware of that subjective feeling. Uh, they do have a physiological component, so it might be that the heart rate is increased, it might be that there's more sugar glucose being released into the bloodstream, pupils might dilate, certain hormones might get triggered and released. They contribute to, um, to the emotion. And there's a, a behavioural component. 
So we might show a certain expression with our face, we might adopt certain body language and we may well say how we feel or scream out or um, express that, that emotion in some, some way. Now, as I said, it's not obvious exactly how these emotions work and there's sort of three competing uh, theories or reasonably well-known theories that you'll see in the textbooks to explain, I guess, the order in which physio physiology, behaviour and um, feeling occur. So in the, the James Lang theory, um, it argues that basically our body has a arousal type response and that we then become aware of that arousal and we then interpret that arousal. So if the dog barks, then according to this theory, we actually react physiologically more quickly than we react psychologically. So you just start running and if anybody, for example, has come across a snake, you'll know that you react really quickly before you even think, oh my God, that's a snake. You find yourself jumping backwards a few feet and then you go, whoa, did I just do that? Um, where did that kind of survival instinct come from? And then according to the James Lang theory, you would then at that point go, oh, you know, I'm, I'm scared uh, and uh, I want to get away as quickly as possible. Um, so that suggests a sequential response with the cognition coming at the end. The canon bard theory suggests that there's parallel systems that are uh, responding. So when the dog barks here, there's simultaneously an auto autonomic nervous system response, which is the arousal, the um, heart rate increasing, sweating, etc., and running. Uh, and at the same time, you become consciously aware that, oh my God, there's a dog barking and it's um, foaming at the mouth. Uh, dog, that looks a bit scary. So that's a kind of parallel processing model. And then there's the Schachter-Singer theory of emotion that um, argues that there's a more sort of cognitive step here before the emotion. So there's the physiological arousal, which can be interpreted in different ways. So, you know, a horror movie is a good example of something that for some people, they get aroused because of this, it's tension, and you don't know, you know, where the baddie's going to jump out from uh, behind the building. For some people, that's really fun and exciting. So they get physiologically aroused by the fear, but then they go, yeah, that's really cool, I'm enjoying that. For other people, that is fear that is very unpleasant and they don't want to go anywhere near a, a horror movie or see blood or, or anything like that. So this suggests that there's an important place for cognitions and different people have different interpretations of um, their physiological re responses. Uh, now here's just an example, I guess, of how this or how um, the cognitive interpretation of arousal can influence uh, what people, uh, what emotion people experience. Uh, Dutton and Aaron conducted a study where they arranged for young men to meet an attractive female whilst they were crossing a bridge. Now the experimental manipulation was that some of the men walked across a fairly low bridge, it was only 10 feet, 3 metres uh, off the ground above a stream and then they bumped into a, a woman. Uh, for the others, they crossed a suspension swinging bridge that was 230 feet or 70 metres above the ground. And then the, the woman who met them gave, um, gave the bloke her phone number and what they were measuring was how often the male called up the female afterwards and um, followed her up. And it turns out that those who walked across the high suspension bridge were much more likely to contact the woman afterwards. 
And what the researchers argue is that what ha what's happening is that on the high swing bridge there's much more physiological arousal, so there's that fear of, of falling, but that the males kind of misattributed this physiological arousal to, to mean attraction towards the female. So they felt more attracted because they were more physiologically uh, aroused. So that line of evidence would suggest would suggest support for um, this shark to singer theory of emotion that the physiological arousal is somewhat neutral and that we then map cognitive interpretation or, or meaning on top of the, the physiological arousal. Uh, there's been quite a bit of work on facial expressions and there continues to be because this in many ways is the kind of window towards somebody's emotion. We spend a lot of time tracking people's eyes, mouth and muscles in their face and intuitively using that information to kind of guess what emotion somebody is experiencing. And indeed there's evolutionary sort of reasons for why we've learnt to express or we've um, been largely programmed to express our emotions uh, because it's a way of communicating them without even talking. And if other people know what we're feeling then it gives them a clue as to how they might respond to us. So if we want to approach someone, we smile at them, we make eye contact um, and that's a way of testing them whether the other person is also interested. Uh, if we want to scare someone off then we snarl and, um, and uh, furrow our eyebrows and, and look angry at them. There's also evidence that simply manipulating your face using certain muscles actually triggers emotions. So it's not just a one-way street. Uh, so people say, oh look, you know, smile at yourself in the mirror every morning um, and that will make you have a happier day. There is evidence that when you smile there is a release of certain hormones that are triggered by the use of those, those muscles. Um, so in um, this particular study participants were asked to take these three actions and you can try it now if you like. Raise your eyebrows and pull them together. Uh, raise your upper eyelids and then stretch your lips back towards your ears. And so that's basically an expression of surprise and, and fear. That's a typical kind of fear response. And then they had physiological measures of skin conductance and heart rate, etc. that would suggest that people were triggered towards physiological um, changes associated with fear. So it might be that there's a facial kind of feedback hypothesis that these things kind of build on each other um, and help you to work out or um, what emotion you're actually experiencing. Uh, there was a famous study done by Paul Ekman and what he did was travel around the world in the mm, I think 70s and he took photographs with him of different facial expressions and um, he went to say Papua, Papua New Guinea and went to some uh, tribes who had never seen uh, Western people before and he asked them to look at these pictures of different emotions and these were the sort of main emotions that were used and to tell him what emotion he thought people were, um, were expressing. And whilst they weren't perfect they were pretty good at recognising those emotions uh, from the facial features and from this it was argued that our facial expression of at least the core emotions is, does seem to be universal. In other words, it's something that's pre-built in. Um, children display them, infants display them um, as pretty much from, from day one. Um, however, what happens is that we get culturally taught over time what it, the display rules are. So some cultures are much more reserved in their emotional expression um, you think probably of Eastern type cultures where not necessarily a lot is given away um, in the facial 
face, facial features, about the emotion. And even in our culture, we tend to override particularly the display of negative emotions like disgust or anger um, or sadness. We tend to try and modify those so that it's not as obvious to other people that we're experiencing those negative emotions. Um, and this science has actually been taken uh, quite seriously now, so it's one of the techniques that's used in um, airports to try and detect um, you know, people bringing in drugs or, or other contraband. Uh, there's, a, there's people watching those monitors and they're looking for quite subtle cues in people's facial expressions and body language, among other things, that might make them think that somebody's acting a little bit um, suspiciously. Um, there is evidence that I guess goes with the social stereotype that women are more emotional. Um, women do tend to report more intense emotional states. Um, they do tend to express op emotions more openly than, than males and are able to pick up better on emotions than others. And that's um, being able to pick up on emotions than others is something or part of what's uh, now commonly called emotional intelligence, which is a combination of being aware of your own emotions, but also being able to pick up on cues, emotional cues that others give. However, there also seems to be evidence that this may be a cultural um, norm that's been created, and so it's um, perhaps one of those, um, whoops, gender differences that is uh, potentially changeable. Uh, another major area of emotion research is to try and identify what are the, the core emotions or what are the emotions basically that we're all kind of pre-programmed to experience and these map fairly well onto those um, facial expressions and there's some agreement and some disagreement about what those core emotions are, but almost all the models include something like these five. Now you'll notice that four of them are negative, anger, uh, fear, sadness and disgust. Now we call, you might think of those as negative, but actually all emotions are adaptive or beneficial because if you don't have the capacity to experience these, then you could get yourself hurt or in trouble. So we try and think of all emotions as actually beneficial because they're all giving you certain kinds of triggers. In this case, with all those uh, red emotions, they're telling you to avoid a situation. Um, some models include neutral emotions, which are things like surprise, interest, anticipation. And Happiness, joy, trust tend to be, there seems to be a smaller range of positive emotions, but that makes you go towards something. Sometimes they list interest, which is in green there. Now there's a lot more emotions than that, but um, psychologists would probably argue that they be, they're what we call secondary emotions, or they might be combinations of those emotions or perhaps even learnt responses rather than inbuilt capacities for uh, emotional experience. Um, there's been an increasing amount of research into happiness and not all of the findings are kind of what we expect. Uh, happiness seems to be most strongly related to relationships, so having um, an intimate relationship, having satisfactory work, an enjoyable work, a role in the world, and to some extent to personality. So some people tend to be happier than others. Uh, it's moderate, moderately related to physical health, religious, having a religious faith, um, cultural values like individualism, 
versus collectivism, uh, political systems, so democracy or at least a stable period of democratic um, society and the general quality of surrounding social relationships. And it doesn't at all seem to be related to gender, age, wealth, intelligence or physical attractiveness. So there's some interesting implications that come out of that and um, we spend a bit of time looking at happiness in the third year unit. Alright, I'm aware that we're at time so I'm just going to skip to the summary. So in summary we can say that motivation is our understanding of the forces that give energy and direction to human behaviour and emotion is basically our kind of psychological dashboard that's saying go towards things or go away from things. So it's our way of working out what is good for us, what to approach and, and what to avoid. So if you're keen to go on in psychology, um, there's a third year unit in semester two. Although it's third year, you only need Psych 101 and 102 to do that unit. So conceivably you could come and do that unit next, in semester two next year. 